episode 258, live from DragonCon 2016. Thank you, everybody, for coming out. I know that uh, people probably partied very hard last night, so uh, we appreciate uh, those of you that did show up. And uh, before we go any further, I do want to thank Derek for once again doing the Skeptics track. A fantastic job. And uh, thanks to Mark Ditzler of AbruptMedia.com, who, as usual, has provided truly professional-level audiovisual support for this uh, entire event. I'm sure he's gotten like three hours of sleep this last four days, so we appreciate him as well. And all the volunteers that have helped with the Skeptics Track as well, we appreciate them. Um, before we go any further, I wanted to have the uh, folks that are up here uh, on the panel introduce themselves, and then we'll uh, get on to our freewheeling conversation. Um, We'll start with you, Mandisa, and just also tell people where they can find you on the web or so forth while you're at it. Sure. Good morning, everyone. My name is Mandisa Thomas, founder and president of Black Nonbelievers Incorporated. This is probably the third time you've seen me at uh, Dragon Con on this on the skeptic track, probably the fourth, uh, <laughs> because I participated in the parade as well. So um, you can find information about uh, my organization at www.blacknonbelievers.org. Okay, excellent. And Gina? Hi, I'm Gina Coliani. I've been a listener of this podcast for at least five years, and I was president of Kennesaw State University's Secular Skeptic Group for a year, and I still attend Kennesaw State, and I've gone to a bunch of conferences over the years, so I'm excited this is my first podcast. Yay! <laughs> and I... While I'm thanking people, I want to thank Gina for stepping in at the last minute. I had another panelist scheduled to be here, and uh, she was sick and couldn't make it. So um, I asked Gina if she would uh, pinch it, and uh, I appreciate it. Okay, so, uh, and a little bit about myself. Uh, my name's John Snyder. I'm the co-host of the American Free Thought Podcast. We've been going for almost nine years. So, again, this is show number 258, so we've... <laughs> cranked out quite a few of them over the years, and uh, my co-host is usually David Driscoll, but he can't make it to, to Dragon Con uh, this year, so I'm doing it without him. Uh, I live here in Metro Atlanta. He lives in uh, Virginia, in the Metro DC area, uh, so when we record, we just do everything over uh, Skype. Um, but uh, And a little bit about the American Free Thought Podcast, as the name might indicate, um, we discuss topics about things like separation of church and state, critical thinking, um, uh, science-based science public policy. We also discuss issues involving uh, the abuses of religious organizations or uh, of people in power who may have religious agendas. And we also try to um, evangelize, if you'll excuse the phrase, uh, in favor of a secular lifestyle, a free thought or skeptic lifestyle. So, if I can get this to work. Um, for this particular panel, I wanted to do a, a kind of a freewheeling discussion on diversity in the skeptic free thought community. And by that, I mean, we'll, we'll discuss these things, but what do we mean by diversity? What kind of diversity is acceptable or not acceptable? What kind of experiences have my co-panelists had with respect to some of these issues? And then, of course, we'll have a lot of Q&A, and I hope everybody came with questions <laughs> and, and or comments. So I guess first let's just, uh, I want to ask my panelists to explain how you got involved in skepticism or free thought, sort of a little bit about your, your personal experience and that kind of thing, if you want to kick it off. Um, sure. Um, I, my experience is a bit unique coming from the African American community. Uh, I wasn't formally raised religious. I wasn't, I never identified as Christian or Muslim or what have you. Uh, I was brought up in what was called the uh, black nationalist conscious community mindset where um, I learned a lot about black history and culture and I learned about uh, systemic racism and injustice so it was definitely more of a social justice um, background that yeah. I came from. Um, I did learn early on about how Christianity was imposed, especially in this country, upon uh, the enslaved captives. 
So um, that that fueled my decision to never become a Christian. Okay. So um, over the years, I kind of like went back and forth with the whole spiritual but not religious thing, knowing that I just still had a, um, I always looked, saw Christians, many Christians as being hypocritical, but not really giving too much thought as to how much I got involved with um, identifying as an atheist. I did uh, for a while identify as an atheist when I was 14, or someone asked me, was I? And so after um, hearing the definition, then I said mm -hmm. yes. But then, you know, kind of, um, you know, kind of rethinking that. But then, uh, moving forward to uh, 2010, is when I re-identified as an atheist and uh, decided to um, get out and meet more people because there were very few um, Black atheists that I knew. Right. And uh, once I found that uh, there was a concentrated number online, that actually compelled me to become more involved and branch out and reach other uh, other um, atheists. Mm -hmm. uh, the problem was, though, that in real life you don't really meet very many. And um, I had heard of some. Uh, I had heard of from other black atheists about how their interactions with with white atheists. Mm -hmm. And so it went, it ranged from being very awkward to just outright being dismissive. And so um, in two, uh, January of 2011, um, it was decided to found uh, Black Nonbelievers as Black Nonbelievers of Atlanta. I'm, um, I'm here local in the Atlanta area as well. Mm -hmm. And part of this was not just because of um, the experiences faced within the secular community, but because the black community still very largely identifies as religious. And so um, the, the, the pushback that I received from my own community was what was, what was looking like it. Uh, it. It compelled me to not just identify more, but also to find more of us. Mm -hmm. So that we can connect the two segments that, yes, we see that there is still, uh, the secular community is still represented as being predominantly white and predominantly white males. There could be other, there could be reasons for that. Right. Um, so we decided that not only was it important to build that support system and community for fellow black atheists and also other atheists as well, but to help um, bridge and um, help people to understand that there is a secular community out there, that there are others who have the same ideas and um, uh, same ideas, same thought process and stuff. So okay. it became important for us to show that yes, there is a growing demographic of, um, of black atheists out there. And so when we're talking about diversity, it isn't just about how we look, it's also about what we do because some of the some of the events and the meetups that uh, we encounter uh, may not necessarily be of interest to some of everyone. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we we pride ourselves on you know our intellectual capabilities. You know, the fact that science education is important, that separation of church and state is important, but also there are other issues that are unique to certain demographics uh, and communities that the overall community necessarily isn't addressing, even right. though they should. And so what ends up happening is that, you know, when, when we even hear Dragon Con, you know, we'll see someone go to, you know, the Sunday assembly table. You know, it's very, you know, very um, broad, you know, it's a very um, wide reaching name, I guess, or general. But when you see black non-believers, there seems to be some hesitance to come over and right. talk to us because perhaps they think that we are only just for black folks, which we are not. Um, but just to have the, it's sometimes there's either the, well, I don't see race or why do you have to have a black non-believers? Well, right. if you had a white non-believers group, then what would you call it? Yeah, well, you call it American Atheists. You know, you call it all of the other organizations that are out there. Right. And you don't need, you don't, they don't need to identify as such. If we could, if we, if we didn't have to identify, then we wouldn't. But because of, again, the, the lack of representation in addition to in addition to like we talked about on the exodus panel uh -huh. um the still uh, large number of people who are uh, identify as strongly religious within the black community it became very necessary but there have there has been some very very good progress over the years that i'm happy to say okay and so um yeah i'll stop here so so would the black atheists would would they freak out if i showed up at one of the meetings 
Well, it just depends, you know, if you're sitting up here <laughs> saying something like, well, I'm not black, you know, yeah. that, that comes off as being very condescending. So, right. you know, it's like that's something that you really don't have to say. Right. <laughs> so, What if I said I'm but, not black, but? Yeah, that's I'm even kidding, worse. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, Gina, I know you have had a lot of involvement at the collegiate level with skeptic organizations, but I seem to remember the very, very first American Free Thought that we did here at Dragon Con that I was approached by this starry-eyed young skeptic with extraordinarily short hair. <laughs> who wanted, it was shorter than it is now. Who wanted to know, like virtually buzz cut short, <laughs> I think, but she wanted to know, you know, were there any groups here in Atlanta, you know, that were involved in skepticism and free thought? So I, I think I may have steered you in that direction a little bit. It's all your fault. <laughs> well, tell us, did, did you grow up in a religious environment, and if so, how religious, or what flavor was it? I grew up Catholic. I was baptized, went to my first communion. We moved here to Atlanta from Massachusetts when I was nine, and we didn't attend any churches here. My parents just didn't like any of the churches here for whatever reason. And so I didn't go to church for years, and then come high school, I uh, started attending a Presbyterian church. So I was religious uh, until I got to about my junior year of high school. Um, I had mental health issues, and so I started to think, if there is a love, either there's, if there is a God, he doesn't have any role in our lives, or why would a loving God put me through this kind of thing? So it really caused me to question a lot of things. And so I, I would say I was agnostic or atheist, but I wasn't a skeptic. I Part, I participated in things like chiropractic and homeopathy and crystals and chakras, and that's really embarrassing <laughs> to say, but you it's true. Start somewhere. Yeah, so, um, so then what happened was when I was um, probably like six years ago-ish, I attended a atheist meetup here in Atlanta, and that kind of changed my life. And mm -hmm. it really makes a difference when you start hanging out with skeptics, because I had never thought that way so now I'm very different mm -hmm. but now, what was the group at uh, Kennesaw State University that you were involved in you were the president of that group right for a while I didn't start out as president it started as um, secular coalition for inquiry and right I forget how I found out about it but um, so I started attending the meetings and then like the next year I was treasurer and secretary and then the next year I was president. I just really enjoyed it and Kansas State for the most part is very Christian dominated. There's at least a dozen different Christian organizations and only one skeptic organization. Mm -hmm. So I really enjoyed being president. Mm -hmm. And you've gone to some of the national um, sort of training and coordinating activities? Yeah, I went to several of Center for Inquiry and Secular Student Alliance student co leadership conferences, and that was always really fun and inspiring. Mm -hmm. And I've been to a bunch of other skeptic atheist conferences. Right. And you were saying that KSU particularly is very Christian. It's North Metro Atlanta for anybody listening to this later that's not familiar with the Atlanta area. <clears throat> Excuse me. So... Um, do you find it difficult to be a skeptic on campus? Or is it something that really doesn't come up? It's mostly just classwork and nobody ever really finds out about it. Well, like the student center, sometimes I would hang out there and do schoolwork or, or, or whatever, and uh, people would approach me who were with Christian groups. And um, like it happened made, like less than a year ago, the last time where they were trying to get my information and, and I was being very polite and then they said, oh, can we have your phone number? And I finally said, I'm, I'm, I'm not Christian, I'm an uh, atheist. So then they kind of backed off after that. But mm -hmm. yeah, that's not uncommon. But um, it definitely helped having a community on campus of people who were uh, similar thinking and have, having friends to hang out with there. So that definitely made a difference. Mm -hmm. um, I know I've talked about this on the podcast before, uh, but for anybody that might be interested, my background, I, I grew up in central Kentucky in a very rural area, literally on a tobacco farm, um, Southern Baptist upbringing. Uh, in fact, I was the pianist at our church Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night for I don't know how many years. Um, 
but my big downfall was my parents were also very much into education. And um, one year for Christmas, my mother gave me a Schofield reference Bible, which is uh, a more academically leaning version of the Bible with all sorts of footnotes and commentary. And that's when I started reading um, things like, you know, the exact meaning of this verse is unclear or this verse does not appear in the earliest known manuscripts as if someone had added something. And that was when I started to kind of wonder what's going on here because, uh, you know, the impression you get from just going to church is that the Bible is the unerring, complete, and non-contradictory word of God. And when you start studying it for literally any length of time, <laughs> you begin to see that that's just not the case. Um, and so I went, I never had any uh, bad experience uh, that caused me to, you know, hate God and give up religion. I just began to read and kind of uh, expand my horizons. And by the time I was in college, I would say, I would perhaps be considered generically Christian, bordering on what you might call Unitarian. Uh, but by the time I was in my mid-20s, I was pretty much uh, a non-believer. And it didn't hurt that my my university technical writing uh, professor was Joe Nickel, who's a very famous uh, guy in the skeptic community. He's a magician who's done all sorts of paranormal investigations, et cetera, et cetera. And, and he, of course, was I mean, younger than I am now when he was my professor back in the early 80s. But uh, I found out that he had published books about the Shroud of Turin and haunted houses, and they were all of a skeptical bent. and that kind of inspired me a little bit to start learning about those things. Um, but I've since been very involved in the free thought community, particularly since I've lived in Atlanta since 1989. Um, I'm a member of the uh, Atlanta Free Thought Society and a former board member. Um, I'm a member of another local group called the Fellowship of Reason um, and a former president and board member of that organization. Um, I'm the veteran of at least three skeptic camps. I'm not sure somebody here could probably tell me, but um, and uh, I'm also a lifetime member of American Atheists and um, a member of the American Humanist Association. And through the American Humanist Association, I am a certified uh, secular cel celebrant or humanist celebrant. And I know there's at least two couples here that I that I married. <laughs> so, yay. So anyway, if you're in Metro Atlanta and you're interested in getting married, not to me, um, <laughs> let me know and I'm, I can help you out. Um, so one thing I wanted to ask you guys about was... Girls. You girls. You <laughs> guys. <laughs> ladies. Is that insulting when somebody says, I'd like to introduce you to the lovely and intelligent <laughs> fill-in-the-blank? They never say the that about is. a guy. They never say that about, well, I mean, if somebody said, I want to introduce you to the lovely, intelligent Gina Coliani, and everybody claps. But if I said, I wanted to introduce you to the lovely, intelligent David Driscoll, people would think, what? You know, that just seems odd. But at any rate, um, it is sort of a sad truth that the face of skepticism and free thought for a hundred years has been a face very much like mine. You know, middle-aged, white man, you know, usually college-educated, um, and it's only in recent years that, that women and minorities have started to really rise to prominence. And, uh, you know, I personally think that demographic diversity is a good thing. You know, I would love to see every skeptic and free thought event be 50-50, men, women, people of every, you know, ethnic background, every religious background, every social background. Um, but I just wondered if you guys had any specific thoughts about why it's important for, like, for women and also for, say, for African Americans to be involved in the skeptic and free thought community? Well, for one, um, like I said earlier, it's good for the representation. There are a number of us who identify, even if not necessarily openly, mm -hmm. for various reasons. But it is important uh, for, it's important for us to become involved because the issues that we are concerned about affect all of us, whether we're believers or non-believers. Right. And it's important to show that there are uh, blacks, African Americans, um, young, old uh, men and women who can articulate 
and who can show that they are skeptic, that they don't just go along with the flow of what is being put out there. Right. And um, I would say, to answer your question, if it says, uh, if it's a... Uh, Offensive, or if I think it's offensive to be introduced <laughs> like that. Now, I personally, I personally would not be offended, but there is something very curious of what about what seems to be an appeal to vanity, right? To right. when it comes to women about right. how we're treated, right? And um, what I'm noticing is that um, there are you wouldn't have to introduce a man like that because heck, uh, most of the men still have prominence, seem to be just based on. You know, you being you being there. Right. So um, I can see how that being introduced can be kind of like an appeal or even condescending at right. times. But I, even I though it say, wouldn't be offensive to me. It but, also yeah. annoys the living hell out of me when um, some man, a politician, even the president does this, is he'll talk about how his wife keeps him humble. Like she'll call him right. on, and, as, and it's like he's throwing her under the bus for, be, for being some kind of shrill harpy that's going to rain down on his fun. And I always thought that was very annoying to, and I mean, they say it in a way to, to praise them as being somehow smarter or better or more disciplined than they are. But it's it always definitely comes like a across, backhanded, it, exactly. it's a backhanded compliment. It's, it's praising and insulting at the same time. Right. Because what I'm tending to find is that um, women, just as we have shown, women have held up the church for many years. Right. Women get involved with the grunt work. Mm -hmm. of stuff and sometimes that's what we get stuck with whereas um, in our community like I said before we we put our intellectual ability above practicality what people actually do people don't understand that organizing is serious work it isn't something that should be taken lightly right. and this is why I commend the organizers at Dragon Con because this stuff takes a lot of work to do yep. it shouldn't be taken for granted and it shouldn't always be that so because someone is good at it that you can always just assume that they'll do it and it, it doesn't create stress on them. Right. And this is a part, this is an aspect that um, in the community tends to be overlooked. And um, I have to wonder, sometimes you wonder if it's the oblivious male who was just like, oh, well, we can get this done, no problem. But uh -huh. do you know what it takes <laughs> to actually get it done? Right. So um, it's like going to Thanksgiving <laughs> dinner where the the men think that their job is to just watch football while they fall asleep. Right, and the women in the, in yeah. the, in the cooking. And <laughs> right. so what, 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 yeah. what I'm noticing is that there are still some reinforced cultural notions about the, the role of women mm -hmm. that are unfortunately still being perpetuated even in this community. The only, we don't only dump religion um, and the God concept. There are other, uh, there are other cultural uh, quote-unquote indoctrinations right. or quote-unquote cultural indoctrinations that um, that still need to be addressed as well, especially right. as it pertains to societal norms, gender norms, and, and stuff mm. like that. Now, while we're talking about the cultural norms, it, there is a stereotype, if you will, that black culture is totally involved in the church. Mm -hmm. that, that if you're not in, that church life basically is black life. Right. And, you know, my experience is you know, if people find out I'm an atheist or that I don't go to any particular church, I might get a little, you know, but nobody's really, really discombobulated by mm -hmm. the notion that I'm not going to church. But is it really true that in the black community that that's far, far more of an issue? Oh, absolutely. With, um, with the historical role that the church has played mm -hmm. in our community, um, there is a you know, there is this notion that, you know, this, this whole, this sense of belief belongs to, is encoded in our DNA. So mm -hmm. it's, it's bad enough if you identify as an atheist, but if you're a person of color who identifies as an atheist, you're seen as betraying your culture. Mm -hmm. You know, you're seen as um, someone who is trying to be, someone is trying to be white. Or you're not, you know, you're you're not true to your community, which which absolutely is not the case at all. But there is a, it's more than a stereotype. It is a perception mm -hmm. that is um, that has been held by both blacks and whites. And what I'm finding is that many whites may be hesitant to approach someone black because the the immediate notion is that we may be Christian. 
Right. Even though historically that that hasn't always been the case, there's always been diversity within our community. There's a presence of um, of free thinkers and humanists historically, mm -hmm. especially during the Harlem Renaissance. Mm -hmm. But we have to wonder how much research has actually been done, and should it always be up to a person of color to always present this information? Because if we consider ourselves skeptics, right. if we consider ourselves um, humanists, and if we pride ourselves on our intellectual capability, then how do you not know that? Right. So there are some definitely some uh, some things there that we um, it is good for the rep it is good for us to be out, but I think more of us could be uh, more present and visible if it seemed like many in the community actually gave a damn or actually had yeah. some sort of information about or insight as to what we go through. Right. And um, I've been fortunate enough to encounter those who have, which is which is excellent. But, you know, it's it's also it can't just be for show that oh, well, you know, you have one person of color speaking during Black History Month or, right. or, or, or occasionally. It has to be something that is done more frequently and consi you know, consistently so that you're actually showing that you care. Right. Yeah, you know, it just point of trivia, one of the books that I read just recently was The Souls of Black Folk by W.E.B. Mm -hmm. Du Bois. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he, it, I was amazed at how much of what he wrote was about a, a Georgia and Atlanta, but then I forgot, okay, he taught here in Atlanta for decades. But, yes. Um, but he was a free thinker for sure mm -hmm. um, and got in trouble, I think. I forget what was it, which college was it he taught at here in I Atlanta? Say, I think it was Clark Atlanta. Yeah, maybe it was mm -hmm. Clark, but he got in trouble because they were required as professors to occasionally lead uh, prayer. And he just refused and kind of miffed some people. I don't know if he got any really serious trouble, but right. I'm sure it knocked them back on their heels that, that why would this guy not want to do that? Mm -hmm. But um, anyway, I wanted to ask you, Gina, about um, it, what is the, from your experience, since you've been to national events as well as local events, what's the split nowadays on gender? Is it still like 85% male and a few girls, or is it... <laughs> You know, is it m more equitable than that? I think it's more equitable. Like the student leadership conferences I would attend, I would say there was a good amount of women. I never felt like I was outnumbered or anything like that, but I've always kind of related more to men than to women, so I think it. I also wasn't maybe as conscious of it as other women are, possibly. Right. And do you ever feel like you're getting any kind of negative reaction from men in the skeptic or free thought community? I think I've been lucky and in the minor minority of this community to, that I can say I've never had like any negative backlash. I've never been harassed, but it also might be because I tend to have a back offish kind of vibe or attitude. So, <laughs> so a lot of people don't like approach me, but I definitely know of a lot of women who have been sexually or verbally harassed and it mm -hmm. makes them uh, feel very unwelcome. Right. But I would like to thank you for having this topic. When you first said that you were go we were going to be talking about diversity in the skeptic community, I, th I said, are you sure you're the right person to talk about it? Well. <laughs> but, but, because obviously in your words, you're an old white male, but. Right. Not that old. But. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Middle aged. But when you started to talk about this topic, um, it made me realize, well, I really appreciate that you're talking about it. And then obviously, like, if you're in the majority, it's important that right. at least some of you care. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's been a lot of discussion. That, that's like a good segue for something else that I wanted to talk about is, um, you know, there's been discussion in the skeptic and free thought community in recent years uh, that I guess you could summarize it by the, uh, the advice of don't be an asshole. And, um, you know, there have been several events, like um, everybody's familiar with Elevator Gate, yeah. the, the thing with Rebecca Watson and, uh, on the elevator. And, um, I was at the, con the student conference where that kind of started. Oh, were you? Yeah. Cause so were she, you aware she, of it when it happened? Or? Yes. Uh, she talked about what happened. He can talk about it if he wants to explain it more. But, um, then well, if you know it, go ahead and just give a summary of it. So she... Rebecca Watson is someone who's well known in this community and she has been a speaker at a lot of different conventions and so at one convention she had a talk where it was basically like hey guys don't be jerks to us to women and and so that night a man who was in the elevator with her asked her if she wanted to have coffee with him in her room 
and it was like late at night and she didn't say hey he was harassing me or anything like that he said hey maybe she said maybe don't do this and right. people just freaked out they just thought that right. was just ridiculous well it was interesting to me that it was it was a trigger um for uh, what she was saying, and correct me if I'm wrong, was that she'd spent all day talking about this, and then the first thing that happens when she finds herself alone is some guy who probably well-meaningly said, I find you interesting and I'd like to have coffee with you. There were probably all kinds of subtext in there, but he wasn't trying to like rape her in the elevator or assault her or stalk her, I don't think. And she just basically <laughs> said, don't do that, that's annoying. Uh, but other people took that to be either a blanket condemnation on her behalf that no man can ever say anything nice to a woman at a skeptic event or on the other hand you know she's being a uh, trying to throw people under the bus and Richard Dawkins famously um, got involved in this and I think kind of cluelessly stepped on uh, basically stepped on his own I don't know reputation by going to an extreme and started talking about, oh, I'm so sorry to hear about this. Think of the poor Muslim women who are being genitally mutilated and and have to wear a sack all day and can't drive or leave the house without their husband's permission. You know, thank God they don't have to be uh, exposed to being invited to coffee on an elevator. And it was like, Dawkins, you, I don't, he didn't yeah. read or get what she was saying and it just made him look like a dumbass, really. Um, well, and it kind of amplified the whole problem that we're having to begin with. Right. Well, and, and one of the other things I was going to ask you guys about, you, you gals, you all, um, was uh, people can sometimes say dunderheaded things. And a lot of it's just, it, some of it's generational. I mean, somebody like Richard Dawkins, even though he's been in the public eye for decades, and you would think would know better. But he's an old white guy, literally, who grew up in academia. He has no idea what it's like t to live in rural Alabama. He has no idea what this typical suburban American experience is. And he gets on these threads and tweets and says things that are just, they're ignorant in the sense that he really doesn't know what he's talking about. But at the same time, he has done a mountain of good for the skeptic and free thought world. So I, I'm just wondering how can we, not we, but particularly women and minorities that find themselves kind of on the pointy end of this kind of stupidity help to steer these people in the right direction without destroying them within the free thought community and getting to the point where you know people are upset that Richard Dawkins gets invited to something because he said something stupid one time. One time. Or maybe many twice. Times. <laughs> yeah. That well, was the first one. Right. But I mean, how much of it might be like, we've really got to just cut this guy off because he's too much of a liability and how much of it can, can be, uh, you know, well, look at all the good he's done, but yeah, he's kind of like that and he's sort of adult. So what do you think? <sighs> There's a lot I have to think about this subject <laughs> here. But, um, well, first of all, we have to understand that, unfortunately, common sense isn't always common. Right. Just because someone is book smart doesn't mean that they have common sense smarts. Um, and that's or something life experience that you, or, yes, type. experience is very uh, important. Uh, or a certain amount of wisdom, which is still important uh, in addition to having facts and evidence. Mm -hmm. And... Um, um, having been, um, having spoken and, and having been involved with another con conferences and conventions myself over these past couple of years, um, as someone who is in uh, the hospitality field, um, and, and I do a talk about what the secular community can learn from the hospitality industry, it is important for people to be able to see things from different perspectives. It, that doesn't mean that you have to agree with it. Mm -hmm. and to understand and you know there is nothing wrong with being able to empathize and and read body language look at what someone else may or may not be feeling or thinking at the time and and always 
at their at you can go you can never go wrong with just saying some simple hello how are you you know ask questions we talk about asking questions all the time in this community Skep mm -hmm. we're skeptics right right ask basic questions not just about something that is educationally based you know try to you know try to read people and maybe see where they're coming from so that you'll so that you might be able to understand or feel well maybe this isn't the right time to say certain things you right. know, yeah, if, you know, it, it may be okay, you know, you may pride yourself on being a person that just says whatever they want, however they want it, but if you truly care about communicating with other people, then you would, then you would um, take that into consideration and, and be mindful that mm -hmm. not everyone is going to uh, see things the way you do and right. that um, pick up on those social cues. You know, if someone doesn't seem interested, then leave them alone. Right. You know, and that and that that is where you know the the sexual harassment policies were born out of. Mm -hmm. You know, being able to perhaps you know be be perceptive, ask questions, and if you're not getting the answer, or if, if if there's a certain answer given, then you can either see whether you can take it further or not. Right. And um, I don't think that people like Richard Dawkins are above learning these social cues. Right. I'm not sure who he has in his ear that um, people have just accepted him for who he is. That just shouldn't be the case. Yeah, I think because, there's a lot of rock star stuff going on. Yes, well, there, some there's people don't seems, think he did anything wrong. Right, right, which, you know, which is which is bad, you know, because sure. even if he had his opinion about how serious he thought it was, what may seem serious to to one may, or what may not seem serious to one is serious to someone else. And it is, it is, it is a, hurtful to be dismissive of what people go through on a personal level right because just because um yeah it's yeah of muslim women in other countries have to go through this does that mean that we have the right to feel disrespected no right well and i so. find it particularly ironic that richard dawkins has and not to continually throw him under the bus but right. he has given the example before when he talks about the scientific method and how science works and that ideas can be refined and even overthrown, he gives an example, and I may butcher the, the retelling a little bit, of being in a room where a professor listened to a presentation by a special speaker who essentially destroyed the professor's preferred um, theory on something. And at the end of the talk, the professor walked up to the man and said something to the effect of, I want to thank you because you've shown me that I was wrong and I want to shake your hand for showing me the better way or something that's a better theory. And that was his example of how scientists behave, but then he can't see that when he gets this roar of disapproval back that he might wanna step back and think, what have I done here? But he, some, it seems like he gets a little, uh, 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 gets his dander up or something about it. Yeah, it gets defensive. Right. Like any human being would, that shows yeah, he's human. I mean, you know, but at the same time, I think it is important for people to understand that if you don't want to have to keep apologizing all the time, you may want to think before you before you right. speak. Think right. before you open your mouth. Or, yes, before or you think before you don't drink and tweet. Now, right. There may be, he may be on his fifth scotch for the evening for all we know. Yeah. Um, but uh, the, the, the other thing was, I was thinking about was uh, is it Richard Carrier that there's been some oh, yes. there's been some news that somebody accused him of sexual harassment and he's saying well I was just expressing some interest in somebody and uh, well what he said was the person who's her accusing me of harassment isn't the person I th would think would be accusing me of harassment which means he thinks somebody else is yes. out there <laughs> right yes yeah the, the person who would accuse me is not the one accusing me okay yeah mm. but what it brings up is this idea that uh, you know uh, as you say people can be kind of clueless you have to put yourself in the other person's shoes i mean even if even though rebecca watson wasn't saying that she felt like she was in Completely imminent, violent, imminent right. danger mm -hmm. you uh, i think guys do need to think about the uh special circumstances that women can find themselves in, that you find yourself alone in an elevator at 2 a.m. with a man that might outweigh you by twice or be able to overpower you or who knows what, and you start saying creepy things, you know, think about that. Think about how she might react to that. Yeah. But it was coffee in her room. Um, right. I mean, there's yeah, definitely, there's that's like more than just morning, subtext. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, maybe it was clear. But that, of course... That also brings up the idea that hey, 
can a guy not go to a convention and express interest in somebody without suddenly being accused of sexual harassment? Um, you know, I, I don't know any of the details about the Richard Carrier situation, or there's been several others who's, I can't think of the names right off the top of my head, people that have been accused of being gropey and that sort of oh, thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, do tell. No, don't tell. <laughs> don't tell. But, the, you know, the idea is there clearly there are certain behaviors that are just outright wrong. I mean, for, for me, I don't get invited to be a special speaker at a lot of events, but I can imagine that if you're being asked to go someplace, it's sort of like a, like a business trip, and you're presenting your organization or even your own brand, uh, that maybe that weekend isn't the weekend to try to hook up. You know, just be a professional, give your talk, you know, go to the reception, glad hand with people, but, you know, you don't have to get creepy. I mean, I wouldn't necessarily classify that as creepy because if something happens, I mean, we're not, we're not religiously based. We're not a church. Right, right. So, I mean, a no convention and a conference. Right, exactly. Yeah. And so I don't think that on its face is necessarily wrong. I think what happens is when, um, again, you know, we can be very socially awkward in this community. Right. And so when no. it, when it, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but when, and sometimes, um, it's some people just may not, and they should, they should be picking up on when certain statements would not be good, um, uh, you know, or like I said, body language and picking up on that. If someone isn't interested or mm -hmm. they may not seem to be, um, you know, once, once it's a uh, clear that it's a no, then just, just no say, I mean, most of my encounters with, with folks at the conventions, um, they seem that everything seems to be going you know go pretty well right. and if they get it on then great but you know hey and or even for the professional who may want to you know there's there's a way to be professional and uh you know personal be at the person. same time but you know <laughs> definitely not with not there there's this sense of entitlement that some people do have that needs to stop yeah you know that you can't just expect for someone to just fall over you or you can't expect someone who you hold in high regard uh, you can't expect that someone else may fall all over them just because you do or fall all over them because you do or yep. hey I'm so and so you need to you know you need to know me or you need to respect me or you need to do this for me no no once you when you continue to treat people like people then this stuff could be prevented right yeah and well, it's there's then there's a whole other controversy where should we or should we not have sexual harassment policies in place at right. conferences? And right. to me, you would think, I, I don't understand why not, but some people really do think that they shouldn't be there, so. Right, and, they, and, they, and apparently with everything that has been going on, it, it has become necessary. Right. Or even if there is a policy, they're not always f followed through. Right. right. Well, that's the, yeah, you, you, I mean, this particular kind of behavior becomes complicated because if nobody actually witnessed it, uh, you know, like a third party, who's to say what happened? You know, some, one person says he was harassing me and the other person says I was just trying to have a conversation and it's hard to, it's hard for convention coordinators to really know what On to do. On the logistical aspect that can be difficult, but that is why there are now, um, there are now um, ways of, uh, there have been uh, ways of investigating implementing. Sure. Now. Yeah. And yes, yeah, so it is up to the organization to do their due diligence right. and find out what happened and make. I don't. I don't think anyone is is um, looking, you know, for a witch hunt. But people want to know that there is a concern about something that happened to them, right. and that you're not just going to say, "Oh well, I need to get all of this information before you start to show empathy and be before you decide to say, "Oh well, decide to, decide to dismiss it." Mm -hmm. You know, there needs to be concern about the people who are there. Right. Right. Um, oh, one other thing I wanted to mention, uh, what can I tell? We're, we're good for time, but um, you mentioned earlier Exodus. Mm -hmm. uh, for people that might be listening to this later, uh, um, tell us about that. Exodus is an upcoming documentary that's particularly about the... Uh, experience of black non-believers, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, I'm very fortunate to um, be collaborating uh, on this project with Chuck Miller, uh, Alabama, and uh, David Person, uh, who's the director. And um, it is going to be a very well-rounded documentary about um, 
uh, featuring the perspectives of blacks who have left religion, um, blacks who are never religious, and also how the black community uh, sees and, um, and perceives blacks who are not religious or atheists or, or what have you, because that is actually, imp that is important. Mm -hmm. um, one, of the, uh, one of the interviewees is a pastor who hosts um, a, a radio show as well, an online radio show, and he's become a very good friend of mine. Um, he isn't, he isn't an atheist or closeted, but, um, when it comes to, um, issues pertaining to human beings or that are important to humanity, we're very much all on the same page there. So, um, it, it, it will be, um, it will chronicle our journeys and our stories and how important it is to understand the dynamic of religion in the black community and, and the effect that it has on, on black atheists and how we need to pro, uh, continue to provide that sense of support as well as outreach and awareness. And mm -hmm. so I'm hoping that everyone here will go to YouTube and watch the sizzle reel and yeah. also uh, go to the Facebook page, go to Twitter and support this, um, support this project. Right. It is very, very important. Mm -hmm. And there, there's also, uh, we, of course, we're going to run out of time, but uh, one of the uh, additional complications in the African American community is um, the Muslim angle. You know, that there's, um, um, I would say, a much higher percentage of African Americans that are Muslim of either immigrant types or people that mm -hmm. are, uh, you know, like Nation of Islam type. Oh, yes. And if you try to get out of those organizations, it can be even worse than trying to get out of your AME church. Uh, it depends. Uh, most, um, most of the Muslims that I grew up around were very moderate. Mm -hmm. You know, they weren't necessarily, they weren't as fundamentalist as in some other countries. Um, I would say that um, when you're talking with... Um, a be that would that would be better discussed with the ex-Muslims of North America. Okay. But um, yes, in yeah. the black community, you do have those who have rejected that traditional Christianity, the Christianity that is associated with the white God, the sure. white the God that doesn't look like us, that has contributed to a sense of I've colorism. Seen of him. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Big beard. Yes, um, but. So many have, uh, they've converted to Islam because of course it is sold as a religion of peace, as a religion that more blacks can closely identify with, which really isn't the case. It's pretty much, you know, it's, a diff it's the same side, you know, it's a different side of the same coin. Right. But as there, when it came to the appeal, especially as when it comes to the social aspects of the community, they present themselves as being better than Christianity. Right. Um, so there is an appeal there, and there was an appeal um, to the Nation of Islam for, for many blacks as, um, you know, as rejecting the white man's religion. Mm -hmm. And so, and there is still a level of supernaturalism. Um, there are many blacks who, even if they don't identify as Christian, they identify as spiritual, and they still subscribe to very, um, you know, like homeo homeopathic remedies or oh, yeah. something that isn't rooted in, in science or in evidence. And so we do have that problem as well, which is why I stress that we stress as an organization that we are non-believers in anything that does anything that doesn't have a, a basis in evidence and mm -hmm. verification. And that goes beyond religion and the God concept. Right. Okay. The, the last main thing that I wanted to talk about, I don't know if we'll be able to really get into it completely, but we've talked about diversity in the skeptic community, and I think we all agree that it's a good thing that there be more women, more minorities of every sort involved. Really, the more people of, of any kind involved. But I'm wondering about what I would call intellectual or even political diversity in the free thought and skeptic community. Um, I would say it's a safe bet that I'm 90% plus or minus of everybody who's in the skeptic or free thought community is probably liberal or leftist. Um, but there are libertarians and there are people who are uh, conservative, and I don't necessarily mean religious conservative, but they might be, that could be interested in these things. And I'm just wondering, you know, what do you think about try, trying to get those people involved? I mean, an example that I've used in the past is if, if I was in the skeptic, a skeptics group and we wanted to promote a vaccine drive and the pastor from the local Methodist church said, oh, we'd like to get on, in on that too. Um, I wouldn't turn that down even though if, if the discussion of religion or skepticism toward religion came up, I, don't, I wouldn't want to feel like I would have to pull any punches, but I wouldn't want them to feel unwelcome in that project. 
Uh, and similarly, you've got people like the Reverend Barry Lynn, who's a sp spokesman for Americans for the separation of church and state. Um, and you've also got uh, liberal politicians like uh, Jimmy Carter might be a good example, uh, who is, um, he's about as religious and evangelical as they come, but I think he's totally on board with, with every social or political project the skeptic or the free thought community might be interested in. But what do you, what do you think about that? I went to a conference, let's say five years ago, it was put on by the Center for Inquiry. It was called, I believe, Moving Secularism Forward. And they had a panel where they had a liberal person, a libertarian person, and a conservative person. And as they were all talking, it, we the whole audience came to believe that the conservative wasn't really conservative. So yeah. they couldn't even find a conservative in the movement. So I, I'm sure... I, I don't doubt that they're out there, but for right. whatever reason, they're just really hard to find or don't want to come right. out. I don't know. Right. I always find it fascinating that uh, when it comes to religious conservative, uh, celeb not celebrities, but politicians or other prominent people, the ones that come out in favor of, uh, for example, gay rights or something like that, they inevitably come out in favor of it not because they've introspected and, and intellectually pursued it, but it's because their own son has come out and mm -hmm. wants to be uh, married like everybody else wants to be married or not marry as, as people might not want to be married. And suddenly, because it's personal to them, they're for it. And I'm glad they're for it, but I wish they were for it for everybody abstractly. I'll tell you something. It's it's always going to be important to qualify individuals who say they want to get involved, who say they want to help, and who say they want to be the ally. Right. Um, as much as um, it would be nice for all of us to be able to work together um, as one community, it isn't always realistic. Right. I, I say people to people all the time, uh, you don't just get a pass because you're black and atheist. There mm -hmm. are others who have to be qualified if you are going to be involved with my organization. For example, we have come across some very homophobic black atheists. Right. Um, no, you will, you will not be involved. You, you will not, I don't, I, yeah, we may agree on the atheism aspect and certain, no, you will not work with me right. if you have that stance. And also, um, just, and, and this goes back to what I said about being able to read, engage people and how they are. That also goes for looking at how they do things beyond what they they say are is good for a collective because you do have some people who push personal agendas mm -hmm. as a collective cause and it's good for <laughs> us to to have to qualify that right. and it's good to have to manage that process you know it's and that that means that there are times where we may have to um, we may just have to not be not work with certain people right. and as as hard or as, as difficult as that might be um, it is very important to understand that you know we're um, we're, we're it, realistically we're not going to be able to please everybody. We're not right. going to be sure. able to work with everyone. And so again, this is where things must be qualified on an individual basis. It's definitely important to look at the individual, what their motives are, because long term, like you said, with the pastors who are only wanting to get involved because it affected them personally, mm -hmm. that could possibly affect how long they're involved. Because sure. usually we, we, we tend to, when something is of concern or passion to us, we do want to get involved. We want to make sure things change, but change is not a quick process and these things take time they can often be very tedious and and grueling and so you have to you have to know that people are in it for the long run and that they're not just in it for themselves or because there's a personal angle for them right now we've also seen especially on youtube for some reason there seem to be an inordinate number of youtube um uh, what do you call them, not bloggers, but people with YouTube channels that are like a, as deeply <laughs> misogynist mm -hmm. and misanthropic as you could possibly get, but they're atheists, mm -hmm. and you know, they, and they believe in separation of church and state, but they're just assholes, and you know, um, I agree that there's a certain point where you, that there's too much of a taint of, of um, uh, not, I don't know what the right word would be, but they're just too much of a liability. To, to be get involved, but I tell you what, supporters. Yeah, well, sure, I, that, yeah, that's a scary that's part the is that people who there are people who support them, right? 
and that, you know, we have a tendency as human beings to look at what's on the big screen. You know, we, we have a tendency to, because we're, because we can be visual creatures, that we are looking at people who are putting themselves out there visibly and thinking that, well, this is the way it should be, or this is what we should be trending or following behind, which, you know, which, uh, which lends itself to ignoring the people who are actually doing groundwork or getting so wrapped up in what they're saying. Like, for example, with the amazing atheist, I'm not sure if that was the one you were referring oh, yeah, to. Yeah, that is he one. He might have been one yeah, of them. Yeah. Um, he asked some very, very uh, ridiculous questions of folks in the black community. And, um, you know, of course, people either praised it or they just got riled up. There are some people, you know, but some people, any publicity is good publicity. Right. And they know that people will react to them. And so that's what gives them that sense of purpose, especially yeah, if they, them. yes, that's, that is what fuels them. And so if, if, if there could, if we could find a way to not give that energy, I mean, it's, it's very, very tempting to always re, to always want to respond to what someone does. But I, and I find, and I'm also finding that, you know, people are quick to express what what they're disappointed in as opposed to what they're good in so right. negativity always seems to win which sucks yeah um we have a, just a few minutes if anybody had any uh questions or comments there's a mic back there um let's see there was one other thing i was oh what it also amuses me this isn't quite as drastic as being a misogynist <laughs> or a misanthrope but in the skeptic community it's always funny to me when you go to the meetings that there's always somebody there that they're they're totally down against homeopathy and chiropractic and, uh, you know, organic foods and all this, but by God, UFOs are real, mm -hmm. you know, or, th or they think that 9-11 was an inside job or chemtrails are poisoning our children with a straight face. And you just start looking for the exits because, uh, you know, I don't know what to say to that. I, I, I haven't personally encountered anybody that was downright, you know, dangerous or evil. Um, but I have run into people that have some very peculiar thoughts on very specific things, and you just can't seem to talk them off of that ledge. But I don't know what it is. skeptics also say that each skeptic has their own downfalls. So oh yeah. yes, what well, every yeah they each. There's one topic right. where you you. Are I haven't not found mine about yet. It. I'm sure you have. One. I'm <laughs> sure that I have one. I don't know <laughs> what it would be, but um, but anyway, yeah, we've got just a few minutes. But uh, go ahead. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, brief background to kind of frame the question. I've been an atheist for over 30 years. I'm just retiring after 20 years in the Army. You can do the math and figure some of the cultural challenges I've had. What I wanted to toss to the, uh, to the female panelists is what are some of the challenges and hopefully successes you've had in trying to overcome those cultural barriers? Trying to communicate atheism within the, you know, the communities. Well, some of the barriers that I face, of course, is um of course, the perception of what an atheist is, as yeah. well as what a woman's role is supposed to be. Um, what has been successful is in showing that because me as a black woman is openly identifying as an atheist, it has been, it has been good for turning around that, pers that, that perspective of what not, ju not just what an atheist is, but that there are other black women who are atheists as well, whereas before it was almost unheard of. So it really has been good for reaching out and, and uh, for our representation and also giving others the courage to openly identify too. Jean, no? Yes, sir. Um, I would say that I, you know, first and foremost identify as a humanist and agree with, you know, all the liberal um, social policies that most of us do. And I think that there are some atheists who are very clearly misogynist and I have no sympathy for them. I don't ever try to defend them. I think that, you know, people need to look a little more critically. When you're talking about Richard Dawkins, Sam Harris, Peter Boghossian, there's a whole list of people that's whole careers are dedicated toward humanist and critical thinking causes. And I really don't think we should smear them with the same brush. And I think we risk doing that. And so when people hear a little snippet of a story, and we talk about it for 10 minutes, how he's done this disservice to the community, anybody who hasn't read this carefully themselves should now feel obligated to go out and read that before passing judgment right. on a lot of those people. Yeah. So we really should be charitable in the sense if somebody's whole life is dedicated in supporting women's rights, gay rights, black rights, and they say something and somebody reports it out of context, go and look. Right. No, I, I think that's an excellent point. And uh, I mean, just by the fact that we only got an hour to do this mm -hmm. and cover so many topics. Uh, but I agree that um, 
you know, we should always, um, in the absence of any contrary evidence, give people the benefit of the doubt. Um, yeah, I'm just going to say real quick, yes, I absolutely agree with that. But when we, we talk about men like, we, we have to also draw that line. Let's talk about Bill Cosby for a moment. Yeah who has donated millions of dollars to historically black colleges and universities. He's helped propel the careers of other African Americans, but now it's showing that he is also a serial predator. Um, right. he, was, he, is a, he was a predatory um, sexual offender. And so even in that snippet of information, we have to be able to draw distinctions with people who, yes, have done some general good, but also not dismissing that they as human beings can be wrong. Do, do I think that it's important to just take the information and run with it and smear them? No. Unfortunately, it is a part of when you're in the public eye, that is the risk you take, though. Um, it's, it's also being uh, kind of realistic. And people's memories tend to be, tend to be pretty fleeting as well. Um, Richard Dawkins is not going to lose out on uh, any fans. And there's a lot of Probably things not. that I definitely respect about Richard Dawkins, you know, as a person and as far as his career and what he's contributed. Um, I just, you know, th but those things should be, you're right, they should be looked at critically. And if people may want to make up their minds about whether they like him or not, then that's, then th that's okay. So right. it's, the, it's, it's the risk that you take when you're, being in a, when you're in the public eye. Okay. Um, do we have, are we out of time or we have no, time? Okay. Ask one more question. Okay, one more question. And it's actually an observation. I had the uh, opportunity to be one of those seven staff photographers at the Reason Rally. And it was made clear to us before the rally that um, all seven of us make sure, make sure we shoot diversity, look for people of color, look for women, look for, I mean, you know, don't look for guys like me. There's plenty of old yeah. white men. And we were about two hours into it, and we're backstage, and we're, we're downloading our photos and posting them online. And it occurred to me, I, 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 had, I didn't have to think about it. We were all shooting, and nobody had to worry about, look, look for the people of color, look for the young kids, look for, mm -hmm. it was a, it, I mean, these, it, was, it was diverse, and it was awesome for that reason, because it, um, all of us agreed it, it, it was a non-factor. Wherever you pointed your camera, you got right. You got diversity. So that was great. It was truly, um, a, it was truly a difference from the first reason rally four years prior, and then um, and now. Right. And I think part of that has to do with the fact that there are many more people exploring atheism, humanism, and um, non-religious uh, perspectives, and the fact that because um, there are groups like black non-believers, because there are groups that specifically target um, certain demographics, um, it has made it a bit easier to represent, mm. like I said, it, the, the, it has made it a bit um, more, more, a bit easier and better for, for people to come out and realize that they can attend these type of events and that there are other organizations within the secular community that may fit their need. Mm -hmm. Okay. Gina, do you have any final thoughts? No pressure? No? Okay. Well, um, we'll wrap it up, and I want to thank you very much, Gina, for pinch hitting, and thank you, Mandisa.